Will you turn with me to Deuteronomy, please? Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm beginning to read. Denise, could you turn me down a little more, please? Thank you. Beginning to read at verse 4. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Let's pray. Father, will you settle us now in your presence? And will you glorify your Son? Teach us your ways and enable us to love him more. Speak to our hearts. For Jesus' name's sake we ask it. Amen. We looked last week at aspects of love. I don't want to go through too much of it again, but when we talk about aspects of love, we read the definition, but I'll not go through all that again either. But really, it speaks of an act of looking at something or to gaze at something. It's the way that something appears when viewed from a particular direction, something that has a characteristic that must be or should be considered. And we looked at aspects of love last week, and we sort of finished around the place where Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7 it says, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy as cruel as a grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. We looked last week at how it says here that uh, love is strong as death, cruel. Uh, jealousy is cruel as the grave. And when we looked at that, we could see how the strength of these things that when our hearts are mourning and yearning and hurting, and we can see the, the very bereavement of it, we see the, uh, the very tearing of it from things that have deeply hurt us and things that seem so final as the grave so cruel as it that snatches things away from us, people away that we love. And here is the thing about it. Lord, the Lord says, my love is, is as strong as death. My jealousy, in other words, my ardent love, my fervent love, my zealous love for you. I love you so much, in other words, he says. It's as, as cruel as the grave is with that hurting that we feel at the loss of a loved one, with that... Uh, Turing of ourselves, it's part of us leave. Uh, the emptiness and the, uh, that, that very vacancy that it leaves, he says, well, well that, if you can, that's in a negative sense, but in a positive sense, if you can understand, I love you with an ardent, zealous love. As empty as you are, my love can fill that. As hurt as you are, my love uh, can help that, heal that. And as much as you feel bereft, my love can fill that for you. That gaping sense of need and want. He says, when you understand my love for you, the ardent, the ardent, fervent, zealous, jealous love that I have for you, he says, it's as strong as death, but it's also as cruel as the grave. In other words, my love is as cruel as that is, so I um, place my love for you. When brothers and sisters, many times, now we're talking about men and women who are his children. And men and women who are in Christ, we find that uh, many of the times we, when we feel him, because we're going to look at love and the Ten Commandments here, they're inextricably linked, by the way. People like today to tear them away that it's all love, love, love. But what they don't realize is it's not a, a man's love, it's not a woman's love, it's not a human love, and it isn't even a uh, as we would say, a flower, power, hippie type of love. There's too much of that nonsense going around today. 
let's all float about in clouds and wave at each other in love on the way past. That's not the love of the gospel, and it's not the love of God, and it's not the love of Christ. God is love in his essence. God is love in his nature and in his character. He is love, but he has wrath. So understand that, not that he sits in a state of wrath for the sake of it, or it's in his character, but he has wrath but he is love. His nature is love. And so the very nature is, if I could put it in human terms, God, excuse the expression, can't help himself, but love you because he has chosen to set his love on you. I know that sounds in a weak fashion, but I hope that you're getting the idea that I'm trying to say in that. So God says, when even the grave takes my loved ones, my love still does not fade for them. When the, when the spirit returns on to God, what's given, he says, and your body goes into the ground, he says, you're still in my love. That won't tear you away from me. And so we looked at all of these words last week. Unfortunately, we can't go through too many of them again. Uh, we will look, if you will, at Romans chapter 8, just for a, a brief reading. And we want to look at aspects of love, looking at the characteristics of love, the, the different aspects of God's love. And we could be at this forever, to be honest, but uh, forgive me if I forget some things. Um, and some people say, you could have said that one or that one or the other one, but there's just so much in it. Romans chapter 8, please, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Notice, here's electing love. In other words, before you were born, before Adam sinned in the garden, God loved you, knew you, and laid his love on you. And sometimes we feel because we have been so wrong or we haven't tried enough, and condemnation comes on us. Listen, brothers and sisters, the, the idea here is, is that God's uh, 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 elect from before the foundation of the world, he set his love in you and nothing can remove it from you. You can't even remove God's love from you. Look, I can't help myself but love my children and I'm sure you're the same. You just love them. And nothing's going to remove your love from them. And these ones who have been birthed through the birth canal of the Word of God and the Spirit, through the birth canal of the blood, water, and Spirit, born again, those who are birthed by God, into God, into His kingdom, into His Son, they can't be unborn. When your child's born, you can't say, I want you to be unborn. And even... Uh, death itself does not take away, cancel out, nullify, nor quench, nor dis or, or extinguish the love that you have for that child. Nothing will do that. And it's the same here for God with his own, with his elect. Notice Paul uses the words here. He says in verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Listen, we may at times be chastised by God for our benefit. And God may allow things to come our way to, to either encourage us or in our way to teach us. And you may be at times, uh, you may be even angry, disappointed, as it were. You, you may be um, on displeased with your children sometimes and things they say or what they do or, or how they have gotten on, but also you can be uh, really pleased with them whenever you see that you know, they're, they're not acting up and they're being good, but you always love them, uh, no matter what they do. And here, there's no one can lay a charge to those who are in Christ. In other words, yes, you may not be exactly what you should be, but you're definitely not what you used to be. And you should be not only thinking that I'm, I, I can be sinless. You cannot be sinless, but you can sin less. And God is saying it through Paul to us, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Notice, it is God that justifies. God is the one in my life through his Son who says, declares me righteous. Me, Ken, the failure. Me, Ken, the man of flesh. Me, the kind of subject, the like passions as the rest of you are, and you as well. And it's God who justifies. How does he justify? By the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and we are in him. So God sees you in his great love. God sends his son for you. 
He quickens us who are dead in trespasses and sins to see the Christ of God in our need of him, to see who we are, sinners on the broad road to destruction, going to hell. And he quickens us, makes us alive. He reanimates us to be able to call upon the name of the Lord and we're saved. When we're in Christ, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. And because we're sealed, no matter, no matter how we are, now, if you're saved, you'll go on. And if you're saved, you'll yearn when you've backslidden. And if you're saved, you'll miss, uh, uh, the, you'll miss him when you grieve his spirit. But nevertheless, his love will never be removed from you. Notice what it says in verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. And every time... Every time we feel we can't go on and every time we feel we're too weak and every time we feel and sense and think that God won't love me this time or anymore or I have no right, you know something you have to remember, you're in Christ and because you're in Christ, then you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are at the right hand of God, as it were, positionally because Christ is at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for you. We don't need a, 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 a minister, or we can't even get a minister to forgive us our sins. We can't uh, confess our sins to a minister or a priest. We can't do that because there's only one whom we go directly to, that is the Christ himself, who is our great high priest, stands at the right hand of God for us. Notice this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul's asking a question to you. Who can separate you from his love? Lord, I don't know if you still love me or not. And when we look at the death, the burial, and the resurrection of verse 34, then we have to say, well, was all that in vain? If I can choose Christ, I can unchoose Christ. If my love for Christ depends on me, then I can unlove Christ and I don't love him anymore. But I can't neither of them because he chose me, he loved me, he keeps me, and that's how I keep on going, and that's the same for you. And even in this, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For as it is written, for thy sakes we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In other words, whenever we are saying, you know, I'm struggling through, I'm struggling through, Paul says, well, then you need to understand God's great love for you. You need to understand that God has bought you with the precious blood of his son that nothing could buy. Remember, it's what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And there's nothing could purchase you save the precious shed blood of Christ. That's how valuable you are. The world and all its riches cannot afford you. Couldn't pay, pay you, buy you, purchase you, nor pay your debt. And yet Paul is telling us here, he's saying that the Lord says nothing will separate us from his great love. Look at the cross, the greatest manifestation of God's love. Look at Calvary. Look at the blood of the Lord Jesus. Look at the suffering. Look at his bleeding and his dying. Look at the grave. Now look at it again, and it's empty, brothers and sisters. It's an empty tomb. He's no longer there. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, said those two messengers from God, the angelic beings, as the disciples ran down. Listen, the actual Greek says, why seek ye the living one among the dead ones? Or why seek ye the one alone whom lives among the dead? Christ is almighty God in flesh. He alone hath life, and he's given it to you, and he has given it to me. So this morning, take hope in his love and his life and then all that he has for you. Notice this, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what can separate you? Ask Paul, and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, what can separate you from God's love this morning? Absolutely nothing. 
Not even death, not even the grave. In fact, he loves you so much when he returns, as we said last week, in the day of the Lord, he will call us from the grave and we will rise to meet the Lord in the air, changed and fashioned a new body. Even the old flesh will be changed. Jeremiah 31 and 3 says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So, in rounding this bit up, it says nothing, which tells us that nothing can remove God's love from us. Nothing can quench God's love for us. Nothing can hinder God's love toward us. And nothing can separate God's love and us. So everywhere you see someone who is in love with Christ, everywhere you see someone who knows Christ as Savior, everywhere you meet a brother and a sister in the Lord, remember and watch how you treat them. Even if you don't like them, you're to love them because Christ bought them. Because Christ has paid for them. And he loves them. God's love is strong as death. It means it's fierce for us. It's mighty within us. It's fortified around us. God's love is jealous, zealous for us. It's over us. It's ardent. It's firm and it's fast to rescue us. This is what this means. God's love for us cannot be quenched, drowned, overwhelmed, nor extinguished. It cannot be washed away by the floods of many waters. In other words, it cannot be so inundated that he forgets to love you. And you and I can have floods in many waters, many waters of hurt and heartache and disappointment and discouragement. You and I can have the hurts and the heartaches of the floods and the many waters of people hurting us and saying things and, and putting us down and, and, and unbelief. And all of those things may come our way. And the floods come over us and sicknesses and illnesses and, uh, and bugs and coughs and colds and flus and tiredness and all of these things come, but yet we are kept in the love of God. We are kept because He loves us and it's because whom He is and not who you are and not who I am. And if we don't get the idea of who God is and how much He loves us and what He's paid for us, then we will never do in God. That's why so many people are falling so far away. Because when persecution comes and uh, uh, even when hurt comes or when they're even losing jobs or, or whatever it may be, people start to blame God and they turn around and they look at him as if, well, you don't love me anymore. Or if someone has some sort of crisis in their family or in their home or in their life, we get the old idea now, well, oh, you must be out of favor with God. Stuff and nonsense, brothers and sisters. The Lord loves you with an everlasting love and he'll never take his love from you. He's a good God. His nature, his character is to love his own. I'll say it again. His nature, his character is to love his own, eternally love his own, and to love them right on to the end, as it were. Having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, we're told in the Gospels. Christ loved his disciples, and he still loves them. Listen. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved you so much and loved me so much that before we knew him, whenever we were in our sin, when some of us were getting up to no good and doing the things we did and we were totally dead toward him, wouldn't have been seen dead sitting under the gospel, wouldn't have wanted to be in a place like this on a Sunday morning. You see, that's the difference of people who want to be in the house of God because God is in them and he wants to join together in union and fellowship with the others whom God is in. And so whenever God commands his love, the word command here. It's spoken of uh, in a present tense. In other words, it gives the idea God continually established his love for us in that the death of Christ remains its most striking manifestation. The death of Christ was the most striking manifestation of God's love that the world could ever know or will ever know. There's not going to be a, a greater a, a, a more blessed, a, a more visible, a more tangible, a more knowable manifestation of the love of God than looking at the cross of Christ. So where do we find it? Go into the Gospels and see what Christ has done. Go in and see him on Calvary's tree. Go there and see him nailed hand and foot. 
Go there and see the crown of thorns upon his brow. Go there and see the crowds around him with their jeers and their tauntings. Go and look at him and go and see the lashes upon his back and the blood streaming from him. Go and see the spear of the Roman putting it in his side. Go and see all of these things and the judgment of God falling for the space of three hours when the sky turns black upon him that should have been yours and should have been mine. Go to Mount Calvary and when you go to Calvary you'll see God loves you. Go to Calvary afresh, brother. Go to Calvary afresh, sister. The problem is we have forgotten Calvary. We have forgotten where Christ has shed his blood at Golgotha and what it truly and really means and what it has accomplished for each and every one of us. You are bought with a price and you're not your own. God owns you. Remember last week, whenever any would come to take away his own, the great love, he says, they're mine. Now leave them alone. They're mine. I love that hymn, our dear Savior, thou art mine. How sweet the thought to me. Let me repeat thy name and lift my heart to thee. You're mine, mine, mine. I know thou art mine. Savior, dear Savior, I know thou art mine. The greatest and most striking manifestation of God's love is found at Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull where Christ hung and bled. And he died. Ephesians 1 and 4 says, According as he hath chosen us. Now get that into you. The problem is today, too many Christians think we chose God. The scriptures tell us completely the opposite. According as he hath chosen us. God chose you. Imagine that. You're his choice. You're God's choice. Me, I'm God's choice. Paul could say he was the chiefest of sinners, yet he was God's choice. But I'm not up to much. You're God's choice. But I don't, I can't do much. You're God's choice. He hath chosen us, saith the scriptures, not the pastor or not the preacher, not the man at the pulpit. But the scripture says, according of he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in wrath, before him in love. Do you know this morning when you're sitting here with your hurt and your heartache? Do you know this morning when you're sitting here with your anxiety, your stress, or your trouble, or whatever your way you're feeling, do you know you're before his face this morning in love? He loves you. He chose you. And he loves you. Now, this love toward God from us, toward God for us rather, this love toward us from God, let me start that again. I've got Marty's in my mouth. Now, this love toward us from God, God expects toward him from us. I'll say it again because I got it right that time. I hope we hopefully get it right again. This love toward us from God, God expects toward him from us. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now notice this. Here is the first commandment. When we look at the commandments and the love are inextricably linked. In other words, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, and the love of God cannot be separated because God demands our love for Him. And God loves us so much that He has commanded the very first commandment, love me with all your heart, soul, strength. The first four commandments are toward God, between you and God. And from six to ten, they are between one another. And so these do, actually, this is meant to be for our nation, that our nation would look at one another completely different, and being in Christ, we would be a a, a complete and total rest and peace with God and man. Well, unfortunately, this is what they don't want in our nation, the exact opposite. It's thrown out. 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Notice, with all thine heart. This means from the very center, from the very center of your core, from the very center of your being, from your innermost parts, with your total and complete commitment. That's what God demands from you. So now we must ask ourselves, do I love him with total, complete commitment from here? With all thine heart, with all thy soul, the word soul is nephesh. God breathed into man and he became a living soul. This is Adam. And it means with all you are, with every breath, with all your mind, your will, your character, your emotions and passions, your appetites, your desires, during every activity, with all yourself to total access. God demands that you love him like that. And outside of this, we are breaking God's law. We are breaking God's commandment. With all thy soul then, with all thy might, it's a word may owed. And it means with all your strength, with every force you have, to the highest degree you can, Someone once wrote that with all thy might is with abundance of your muchness. And it speaks of the magnitude or of a certain degree. Genesis 4 and 5, let me show you what it means, all thy might. But unto Cain, and to his offering, had he not respect. That's God when Cain and Abel brought their offerings. Had he not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The word very is the word may owed with all thy might. And it gives the idea, it wasn't just that Cain was a bit disheartened, and it wasn't he wasn't a bit down, he wasn't a bit depressed, it wasn't that Cain was a bit uh, disgruntled, it wasn't that even he was a bit angry, it meant he was very wroth, or full of wrath, very, very, very angry. So angry he killed his brother. That's the word on the, on the plus side, God says, with all your might, with that passionate drive for me, that's what I demand, he says. For example, Genesis 13 and 2, it says, and Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. In other words, Abram, before he became Abraham, he wasn't just a rich man. He wasn't just a man who was one farmer or, or one herdsman among many. He wasn't just a man who was a rancher among many. He was a very, very, very rich man, very prosperous. And God says, leave your family and your kindred and, and come out to a place where I'll show you. And he went out not knowing whether he was going, looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And imagine what, what God calls him from. The test of it is when everybody else looks like they have got something and it seems such a blessing, are you willing to give all you have to go out? Are you, do you have all, uh, all that is within you, the ability to say, Lord, take me and use me as you will, because my heart belongs to you. Samuel Rutherford says, since he hath looked upon me, my heart is not mine own, for he hath run away to heaven with it. So we have to ask, has Christ run away with our hearts to heaven? So Abram was very rich. Genesis 15 and 1 says, and after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. The word exceeding is the same word for very. It's the same with all thy might. It's the word may owed. He says, Fear not, he says, for I am the one who's your exceeding great reward. In other words, don't you worry about the lands that you give Lot. You'll give Lot. And don't you worry about the homeland you're going to leave behind. And don't worry about the family. And don't worry about the friends. And don't worry about all your mates and all those sort of things. Here is a call, as it were, of the gospel. And he says, you come out in faith and follow me, and I'll be your reward. It takes faith to believe in a kingdom of God. It takes faith to believe that God is more for you 
in the next life than he has in this. And sometimes we say, Lord, we believe. And sometimes we say, Lord, we understand. And sometimes we say, Lord, we're more looking for the kingdom of God than we are. Uh, And we're looking for heaven rather than the earth, but yet we scramble for so many earthly things. We scramble for so many worldly things. He says, will you leave that and trust me, Abram? You're a high father. In other words, you're very rich among all the people, but I'll make you a father of many nations if you trust me. I'm sure he did. We're here. So here we see the Lord says that he, we are to love him with that degree, that degree of love with all thy might. You know, Jesus asked Peter, risen after being denied by Peter three times at the lake of Galilee, you say of Galilee, love us thy meat. He wants you to love him. God wants you to love him. Revelation 2 and 4, the church of Ephesus, the risen Christ, the glorified Lord, he shows the revelation of Christ on the John. And he says to the church at Ephesus, nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I want you to love me. I love you no matter what, he says. If you love me, listen to what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Hey. You'll not hear that with too many televangelists today, sure you won't. Live how you like. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, Romans 13 and 10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. See, just love everybody. Do you see man's love, brothers and sisters? It's not worth that. It's not worth that. Man can be so fickle and let you down on the drop of a hat. Love you one minute and cut your throat the next. That's cruel, isn't it? But it's true. It's true. But when God says he loves you, the idea here is love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, it's talking about the commandments from commandment number six to number ten. To the neighbor, six to ten, loving one another. One to four is to God. Love worketh no will to his neighbor, therefore love is a fulfilling of the law. In other words, if we love one another, the things that are in the law will genuinely come out if we first love God. Commandments one to four, if we love him with all we are, with all we have, we will be aware, we will be conscious that there's a God and we couldn't hurt one another. We wouldn't let one another down. We wouldn't despise one another. We wouldn't, uh, we we believe that there is a heaven and there is a God whom we'll stand before because we are so in love with him, we'll love one another. And that is the Ten Commandments encapsulated. The young man comes and says, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, uh, it gives him a row of commandments to do. He says, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What yet do I lack? And the commandments, Jesus, when he was asked as well at another time, he was asked, uh, good master, he says, uh, 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 what is the first and great commandment? Jesus replied, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, for the second is like an unto it. And and Jesus encapsulated the Ten Commandments in those two verses. In other words, the first four, loving the Lord thy God, there's no graven images, and you'll not take his name in vain, and you'll remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to worship him. And and when we don't keep the Lord's day, brothers and sisters, you may think, oh, here he's on, he's going to rub it on about a Sunday and come into church. When we don't keep the Lord's day and we're doing our own thing, we're not showing our love for God. It's as simple as that. Love takes legs. The greatest love has long legs, brothers and sisters. The greatest love that you can do manifests itself strikingly in how we conduct ourselves with one another and before Christ and in his company.
commandments. James says 2 and 8. James 2 and 8 says, If ye fulfill the royal law, notice the word royal, the royal law according to Scripture. Ah, you see, why does James say according to Scripture? Because the Jews had put their own commandments of men, traditions, and said they were laws. Wasn't laws. They were, uh, they had totally mongrelized the word of God and his commandments. They totally mongrelized it. So, James says, if you fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, not according to tradition, not according to what men say, but the real law. In other words, there's things that we're told and we're things that we're taught and there's things that men say and we don't search the Scriptures to see if those things be so. And he says, see the word that's in here. Half of it isn't preached out there or maybe more than that. And so what he's saying is the royal law is the law above man's law. The royal law is law according to Scripture, not according to man, which brings us to royal love, because if we love, we fulfill the law. Which brings us to royal love, which is above man's love, and royal love is a love according to Scripture, not man's weak and fickle love. I've told you before, I had a man used to tell me all the time at the door, I take a bullet for you, I love you, I take a bullet for you. He left me when somebody else fell out with me. I didn't even fall out with him. I'll take a bullet for you. I says, well, I hope you don't have to. And the way things are going now, I might want him back into the church just in case because <laughs> things are getting hot and heated. Notice this. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of charity. I'm not going to go into this. I want to stop this here. Charity is God's love with legs. Charity here, the word love, uh, is used 28 times in 24 verses. And the word charity here simply means love, but it's agape love. There's four words for love in the Scripture, and I can't go into them now. God willing, I will do that again. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. Sorry, yeah, verse 17, pardon me. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, this is the inextricable link continuing. Notice this, verse 17, Revelation 12. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now you're told, don't worry about the commandments, aren't you? What does that say? This is end times. This is now. This is from... Uh, this is from... Uh, A.D. 70 or so onward. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And you know what the testimony of Jesus is? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So it's the spirit of prophecy of a coming Christ, us looking, watching, waiting for him and the outlaying of God's plan and purpose throughout the nations and throughout time here, throughout this world. And they're saying, for those who are keeping those commandments, loving God with all their heart, desiring him. In fact, when God says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, the word there gives the idea to breathe. Thou shalt breathe after him. Every breath with all you have from your deep innermost recesses of your bowels and your being and your heart, breathe after me, he says, with everything you have, with all your strength, with all you are, every moment of every day, breathe after me, breathe for me. He says, come on, breathe. 
These people here, the dragon, the old serpent, the devil throughout time, has tried to quash the Christ in us. But men and women who have been born again of the Spirit and washed in the blood, God's elect has breathed after him, even in the flames in the furnace. Even when they're at the fires of Smithfield and burned as torches by the Roman church. Even whenever they're thrown to the lions in the early Roman days. They're breathing after him. Surrender your life and we'll spare it. I can't from Christ and we'll spare your life. I cannot because I breathe after Jesus. I breathe for him. With all I am and with all I have, every moment of my every waking hour and even in my sleep, I'm breathing Christ. I'm breathing Jesus. Brother, sister, start breathing after him. Every breath I take, every moment I'm awake. Is that what we say? They keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Romans, uh, Revelation 14 and 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Notice the word patience. Persevering through it. Persevering in the hard time. Breathing after Christ no matter what. Sometimes you get a shallow breath and you feel your breathing stopped. Keep breathing for God. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's the book of Revelation for you. That's not the book of Genesis or the Psalms. Revelation 22 for our final one. Revelation 22, the very last chapter, almost the very end of the Bible, verse 4. 12, please. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work, as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. Blessed are they that his commandments. The very end of the Bible. Don't you let someone put it over your, the wheel over your eyes and say, oh, this is all done away with. I'm a New Testament Christian. Listen, see if you know the Old Testament, you'll see the Old Testament the whole way through the New Testament. Brothers and sisters, so what do we do? I've failed. I fail every day. All that heart, strength, and mind, I fail every day. I may not make a grave an image, but I have an image in my mind. I may not take the Lord's name in vain, but sometimes I, m- maybe your, your mouth isn't the way it should be. Your thoughts about him aren't the way they should be. What am I going to do then? Am I on a road of destruction? No, you see, the difference is nothing will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and we're saved by grace. God says, look, you do your best. I do the rest. In fact, he does it all. And grace carries us on in him. We're growing into Christ. We're growing up into the huias, agapitus huias, the love, beloved son. We're growing up into him, the one who has all authority, complete charge and control, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's coming up close to the Christmas time and people are everywhere. I don't know why to do. I need to do another one because there's so much material. I want to show you more. And maybe wait the after next week or the week after. I don't know. We'll see how we get on. Um, in the morning time, that is. I'll see how we get on. I might bring something just more around the season in the morning. I'll see how the Lord leads me on it. But God bless us. That's another aspect of love. If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. A new commandment, he says, I give unto you that you love one another. There's another one. A new commandment, I give unto you that you love one another. So see, every time we are, any time we are spiteful or hateful or hurtful toward a brother or sister, the Lord is looking and he's saying, You don't love me. You don't love me. See, next time you're sitting and you're tearing somebody to bits or someone else says, walk out of their company because they don't love them. Mm 
I don't love them. We may speak about things to try and encourage people, speak about things to change things, but I'm talking about venom. Some people are some venom. They do not love him. How can you love God who you have not seen when you can't love your brother that you can? It's the word of God. Aspects of love. Can we sing a hymn? I hear the words of love.